continue this morning the much longer narrative, as it turns out, of uh, the patriarch Jacob, after whom we as adopted children of the people of God receive our name Israel, because along the way he will be renamed with that name. And uh, for those of us who have uh, miss the impact of the grace of God in our lives, um, we really need to uh, be reminded of the fact that uh, God names his people after this guy Jacob, who is just one of the most obnoxious, irritating people you would ever want to meet. And wouldn't it be God's way to choose him as the one through whom he is going to name his people? And we'll get to that event next week. For those of you who are readers, I would like to recommend to you, and maybe it's still in print, but you can get anything on Amazon, uh, this book by Craig Barnes, uh, which he wrote when he was the pastor of the National Presbyterian Church. And it's really the narrative of Jacob and, and partly the narrative of Craig's life. Uh, and he has entitled it, Hustling God. And we chuckle a little bit. Uh, I chuckle a little bit, first of all, because I went to college, uh, I was just sharing this with the folks in the prayer meeting, with a lot of sons and daughters of, uh, Northern Virginia and the DC area whose parents ran the country. Uh, they were the sons and daughters of the military, the congressmen and that whole Washington complex. And for a kid from a small town outside of Philadelphia, that was an eye opener to be exposed to that uh, culture. Uh, that's Washington DC. And some of you are smiling to yourselves because you have had sons or daughters that have lived in that area, or maybe you have been exposed to that area. But uh, he was the pastor of the National Presbyterian Church when he wrote this book. It's about Jacob, and he calls it Hustling God. And it's a clever little title. We chuckle a little bit when we hear that title. Uh, and that's exactly what Jacob is. He's a hustler. And uh, it's hard to admit, folks, but that's what we are, too. If we're really honest about our struggle to receive the grace of God, we begin to realize as we look back, we're always hustling for an angle with God. We always want his blessing on our terms or as a result of the little angles that we play out in our lives. And what we begin to understand and what Jacob has to begin to understand is that God has already chosen you not only to be blessed, but to be the one through whom the world will be blessed. Would you just relax and let him bless you? But he can't. And that's the sin within us. We have to control the process. And uh, we're going to see Jacob play that out over and over again. Uh, until in one climactic scene, he's really going to have to give it up. And it is only at that point that he begins to realize the blessing that was already there for him from God. Uh, but he's not there yet, not at this point. And you'll recall last week uh, that with the help of his mother, who favored him, Rebecca, and his father, who favored his brother, his twin brother, Esau, 
he has not only stolen the birthright, although he did that right up front, at a time of weakness for Esau, or at least perceived weakness, when he came in from hunting and said, I'm starving, and Jacob said, well, I'll give you some of this red stew here, uh, you know, if you give me your birthright. And Esau, who really didn't give a rip about his birthright until he lost it, he signs over his birthright to him, and he gets his stew. Big prize uh, for such a valuable inheritance. Uh, well then, when it's time for the blessing, that kind of goes along with the birthright. Usually the one who receives the birthright receives a double blessing with the help of his mother. You'll recall that Jacob stole that as well. And we were left last week with the fact that Esau, when he comes in later and finds out that the blessing has been stolen from him too, he quietly decides and announce to, announces to a few people that he's going to kill Jacob as soon as he can get the chance. And Rebecca, Jacob's endorser and protector, begins to make plans to cover up from this. Esau kind of helps them out. Against the command of God and the wishes of his parents, he has married two Canaanite women, Hittite women specifically, um, and they are just irritating not only Rebecca, but Isaac as well. Now, they're adults now, but they live in this larger community, so they see a lot of each other. Uh, and uh, he has married the foreigners who they have been forbidden to mix with. Uh, and uh, I'm guessing they're not only Can Canaanites, but they're probably a couple of really irritating women. And they are irritating not only Rebecca, but they're irritating Isaac as well. And Isaac favors Esau. Esau is the one he really likes. And he confesses to Rebecca, those two women are driving me crazy. And many of you will notice, we'll see how quickly, how many women did he marry? Two women. And what was the problem with his grandfather? He was married to one woman and at her suggestion slept with her other uh, maid and uh, got her pregnant, desired to get her pregnant, ended up with two sons, finally had to cast them out because the one woman got jealous of the other. In fact, when the when the maid became pregnant, she began to mock the barren Sarah. And then Sarah finally had Isaac, and uh, all kinds of problems uh, began to occur. Isn't it interesting that a pattern has now been established? Don't imagine. You know, it's easy to read the biblical account and imagine, well, you know, it must be okay with God. All of these guys had more than one wife. And yet the blessing for all the world was to come through them. Read the history of the kings. I once did a Bible study, it probably took us about a year and a half in, on Tuesday mornings at a local restaurant on the kings of Israel and Judah. And uh, we entitled it, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. It was mostly bad and ugly. And even the few good ones, and there were only a few in all of the history of the people of God until the monarchy crumbled once and for all until the reign of the king who is forever and ever Jesus Christ. They all had several wives. And guess what happened? 
it got them into big, big trouble. And some of you who are wives are thinking to yourselves, yeah, one husband is enough. Juggling two or three in the same house or in the same family unit would be next to impossible. It works both ways. God created marriage for one man and one woman. And we violate that. And it's very interesting. The people of Israel institutionalized it. They distinguished between concubines, where no marriage was taking place, and actual wives, where there was a marriage. Neither was pleasing to God. And oh my did it multiply and accelerate the confusion. So what has already happened is that Esau has uh, begun this pattern in his life, and basically what he's going to do during the course of this narrative, when he finally realizes Esau's a little slow, it takes him a while to figure out that his marriage to the two Hittite women is irritating his mother and father. It finally dawns on him. So to solve the problem, he marries a daughter of Ishmael, his cousin. Hagar's son, Abraham's other's son, one of his daughters, he will marry. So now he's got three wives. And the beat goes on as Sonny and Sher would sing to us. So that just sets up a fuller palette for the hustle to take place. Listen to the word of the Lord from Genesis 28, verses 10 to 22. They have told Jacob, who's willing to do it, not to marry any of the local women, they want him to go off uh, and go to the land of Haran, where Isaac, uh, uh, the servant, had once gone for Isaac to find a wife and to find a wife from their own people, worshipers of Yahweh. So Jacob left Beersheba, and he set out to Haran, which is all the way up northeast from Beersheba. Beersheba is to the very south of what we now know as Israel, and he goes north uh, up along the west side of the Jordan River, and then he will eventually cross over. And uh, when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set, and taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep, and uh, it's very interesting, as often as I have read this, I have been fascinated by the fact that that detail is included in the word of God. I, I really don't know why. Maybe it's supposed to be the source of his restless sleep, but uh, I can think of a lot better uh, things to use if I'm out and sleeping on the ground than taking a stone and laying down to sleep. Uh, and of course, those of us who don't have much of a cushion up here, the idea of a stone uh, is even a, a little more grating, but that's what he does. He lays this stone under his head and he goes to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway, or in some translations, a ladder resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it, and in some of your translations it will say, and it's even footnoted in the NIV, that that can be translated beside or above. There above it, it says, stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which 
you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out the west and spread out to the west and to the east to the north and to the south all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring I'm with you and will watch over you wherever you go Hear those words God will repeat these throughout biblical history. A simple little line. I am with you. And I will be with you wherever you go. Remember Jesus' last word in the commission he gave to his disciples? It was the very last phrase of that commission. And don't forget, he says... I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Don't forget that, everyone. He will be with you. And I will bring you back to this land. This dream, and it's a real impact of a dream, as Jacob is hearing it, if his mind is functioning at all, he must be thinking, but I'm going in the opposite direction. 500 miles away from the land of promise. And yet the Lord is reaffirming this covenant promise and blessing. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. And when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't aware of it. He was afraid. That's an interesting emotion, isn't it? And he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and he set up a pillar and poured oil on top of it. So his pillow has now become a memorial stone. He called that place Bethel, Beth-el. Beth meaning house of, El meaning God. Uh, Do we have any Italians here? Raise your hand if you have any Italian blood in you. What's our Italian word for house of? Restaurants use this, Shea, C-H-E-Z, Shea King, the house of king, or whatever it might be. Uh, Beth is that word in the Hebrew, the house, Uh, and in this case, Beth El, the house of God. It becomes changed in its accent to Bethel. We usually say Bethel. And what famous person was born in Bethlehem? The Lord himself, when he becomes a human and lives in the midst of us. This location was formerly called Luz, and it is renamed as Bethel. It's due north uh, of uh, the site of Jerusalem. Early the next morning, Jacob took that stone and and made a pillar out of it and called it Bethel, and then he made a vow. And he said, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey that I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And the stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray silently for the proclamation of God's word for all of us this morning.
Lord, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I searched through our hymnal. I didn't search first or hymn by hymn. I looked in the index to see if there was an old chorus in there that many of you sang when you were growing up in youth group or uh, Christian endeavor hymn sings or whatever. It was often used as an inspirational chorus uh, at the end of a special meeting of some kind, often sung around campfires at Christian camps. Uh, and I'm looking around uh, most of us are old enough that we remembered when it was popular. It's not in our hymnal. Um, it's, it's probably was often in what we used to call the Christian service hymnal. Uh, and it is entitled, and many of you will smile and nod your heads. Some of you are already smiling and nod your heads. We are climbing Jacob's Ladder. And usually at the end of an inspirational message, they would say, everyone stand and let us sing this chorus of consecration. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. And it ended, soldiers of the cross. Every step goes higher, higher. Brother, will you follow Jesus? Sister, will you follow Jesus? Soldiers of the cross. And we sang it oftentimes with tears in our eyes. It was very inspirational. How many of you sang that song growing up? Boy, you can tell how old we are, can't we? Katie's sitting there, and she, she has no clue what we're talking about. She never heard that hymn in her life. There's a, there's a problem with that hymn. I just read it. Who's climbing the ladder? The angels. Jacob's, Jacob's not invited to climb the ladder. Although hustler that he was, if it wasn't a dream, and maybe even though it was a dream, he was ready to find his place in there and inch his way up and down that ladder. Because he's a hustler. And he's going to continue for a while to be a hustler. And we're hustlers too, aren't we? Oh yeah, we're soldiers of the cross. Boy, I had a great week at camp. Let me get on that ladder. I've been good in Sunday school. I've got five stars there up on the chart. I'm a step higher. No mockery to the hymn writer. And you'll read about this in Barnes's book. But God, God doesn't call us to climb the ladder. God stands above or beside the ladder and his messengers, the angels, who, by the way, if you read the letter uh, to the Hebrews, the angels were created to serve us. Isn't that exciting? The angels, which means messengers of God, were created to serve those who have been saved by the Son. And God gives this image in Eastern literature. This is a very common image. But as was often true for God's revelation to the Israelites, there was always a twist. In the ancient literatures, the gods used to come up and down a ladder or a staircase from the heavens. But God doesn't come up and down the staircase. God's there. His messengers 
come up and down for the purpose of blessing us. But just as the hymn writer fell for the trap, so do we. We want to join the angels, kind of take their place. We don't need to be helped. But we'll make a deal with them, <laughs> and they can help us go up and down the ladder. It'll take Jacob a while to realize that that's not what God is up to. But nevertheless, as we see, this becomes, as you can imagine, quite an experience for him. He recognizes that this dream has distinctively come from God. And he assumes that this is the home of God. So he renames it Bethel. He sets up a memorial. And for years, that spot became a memorial to that. And, and notice the word that the translators use. And we see it quite often in scripture. And, and I think we have to recognize that word. He says, this is awesome. And unfortunately, that word has lost its punch. We almost expect to see a guy with a surfboard under his arm and a peace sign going, awesome, dude. <laughs> or someone with a limited vocabulary being interviewed after a big game uh, on a sports channel saying, oh, it was an awesome time. And once the word is used once, you find people finding no other word to express their awe except to use that word. It's a great word. It's the most appropriate word to use here. And of course, if you go back to the old King James Version, the, the word it's most often associated with and sometimes synonymous with is fear and trembling. So don't get the idea that when Jacob says here, this is awesome, that this is just some kind of casual, cool, throwaway expression for him as he awakens and tries to comprehend the stupendous nature of this dream and the promise that comes with it. The word of the Lord saying, the blessing is with you. Just as I said to your father Abraham and your father Isaac, the whole world is going to be blessed through you and your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And there's no awesome dude from him. There's, oh my. Whoa. Oh. This must be the very house of God. And so he takes a stone and he marks it so that from that time on, anyone who passes through will be aware of this blessing and this promise. His hustle has been interrupted because little does he know <laughs> what's in store for him. <laughs> and we're going to see next week that the hustler is going to meet another hustler. And oh my, what a turnaround of events that is going to be. Some of you are aware 
from your extensive background that these days now, and uh, it was interesting that Jim, as he introduced worship this, mo this morning, uh, reminded us that this was the sixth Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, how many of you remember the designation that we used to give to this time for the Sundays after Pentecost and for the Sundays after Epiphany? What did we used to call that? Anyone know? Ordinary time. We have friends here from the Middletown Church, and uh, I can remember when I was the interim pastor at Middletown, uh, I didn't use the designation Sundays after Pentecost. I would just put the 10th Sunday of ordinary time. Well, my first year uh, there at Middletown, one of the women of the church came up to me uh, after the worship service, uh, and, and with a real desire to understand, she got this confused look on her face, and she said, John, like she'd been trying to figure it out for seven or eight weeks, she said, John, what is ordinary time? She saw it in the bulletin every week. And I used to put a little blurb on the front of the bulletin, bulletin during those times of ordinary time, and we are in the longest ordinary time, these Sundays after Pentecost, that these are the times of the Christian year when God often chooses to do extraordinary things through his church. Ordinary time, simply put, are those times of the year when there are no special feast days or celebrations. So this ordinary time will end with Christ the King Sunday. And then the following Sunday is when the Christian year begins again with Advent. The first ordinary time is after Epiphany. And that briefer ordinary time will end when we begin the Lenten season. It's ordinary time. And frankly, most of us came this morning shrugging our shoulders. Well, just another Sunday. Ordinary time. Not Christmas. Not Easter. Not Advent. We're not lighting any candles except for those. And Jim almost forgot just before he said, I better get up there and light those candles. We do that during ordinary time. Nothing special happening this morning. Just wonderful music that we get to participate in. The word of the Lord. Ordinary. The PNC has been working for over a year. Ordinary. Nothing to announce. Ordinary. Gee, I wish they'd get the work so we'd have something special for a change. Ordinary times. It's ordinary times for Jacob. Conniving and hustling. Fighting with his brother. Looking for favor from his mother while he's sneaking around his father. Ordinary times. On the way to get a wife, goes to sleep on a stone. We'll get up tomorrow morning and start off again. Ordinary times. And then God intervenes. Good question to ask ourselves this morning. What are we doing in these ordinary times? What were our expectations as we came this morning? Every once in a while, something happens to make our antennas rise a little bit. I got ambushed this morning because all of a sudden I'm sitting up here and I look out and I find out my son's here. 
And my first thought is, oh, I better behave this morning. <laughs> Remember when the son often thought, I better behave, my dad's here. So for me, it's not so ordinary. Because my son went to the trouble to get out of bed and to come. And his little eight-year-old niece is at church with Marlo beginning her VBS this week. Ordinary times. How ordinary is it? Because this is the time when God does extraordinary things. You'll notice in your sermon outline that the end of the outline asks that question. What are we doing in our ordinary time? And there are a few questions that are meant to provoke our thought. Are we recognizing God's grace? I heard a grunt over there. Sounded like a grandchild grunt. Oh, are we ever recognizing God's grace? Because in the midst of this ordinary time, whoo, a new life. Pursuing our own schemes. What's running over and over in our minds? Making appropriate or inappropriate plans in response to God's invitation. What's in What's God inviting you to be or to do this day or this season? A renewed sense of vision and commitment to our church with our time. Our financial support, our energy, and our gifts. And notice the last phrase there, as a new era begins. And I know as you read that, it sounds awful assertive, a new era. And it might strike some of you kind of with a heavy breath, like, I don't think I can handle a whole new era. Maybe I can handle a little change, but a new era Hey, like it or not, folks, a new era, one way or another, is coming. Are you ready? <laughs> Are you ready to place a memorial stone and by the grace of God shout out, this is awesome. This is the very house of God, and it is. And we are the people of God. And where that happens, where God is, there is a staircase. And the messengers of God, whether we see them or not, and I've never seen one. I've got my angel story, but I've never seen an angel. Some of you probably have an angel story where you saw one. They're there. Climb in that staircase, that ladder, back and forth, so that we don't have to. We don't have to hustle God. They're hustling for God. And as they do, he is present above or to the side of, in the midst of all that is happening. Be assured, everyone. Be assured. With all of his conniving spirit, this is a time for Jacob that is very special. And for us as well. We are not going to close this morning by singing We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. I promise you that. Dee could probably have prepared it for us, but we're not going to sing that this morning. But let me pray, and then we'll sing our final hymn. We thank you, O oh Lord, 
that you do the work ahead of and behind us and upon us. That you are the one that oversees the blessings and the challenges that come to and from the heavens. We thank you that today, sometimes when we acknowledge it and sometimes we don't, that our lives are in your hands and they are very good hands in which we can rest. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.